Hello, everyone who's in attendance, and we will have other people join us along the way, I'm sure. Um, welcome to today's webinar on linking supply chain management to coverage. This is Greg Roche, and I'm here again with my colleague, Barbara Lamphere. We're both very happy to be with you to present today's topic. I'm sorry I missed the last webinar. I was on work travel, but I understand that it was a very good discussion and I'm happy to be back with you. As with our other webinars, we will try to leave time for questions at the end of the presentation. As an ongoing reminder, please use the QA function by clicking on the QA button at the bottom of your screen, as shown here, rather than sending questions using the chat function. Now let's get into today's webinar topic. This is our fourth webinar in the Immunization Supply Chain Leadership Webinar Series. We want to welcome those who are joining us for the first time and thank all of you for investing your time to learn more about supply chain leadership. If I remember correctly, this topic, linking supply chain management to coverage, had a high number of responses Quests when we were doing the needs assessment for the webinars. So I hope that it will be of interest and useful. Just to introduce ourselves again, I know many of you have heard from us before. Um, I'm Barbara Lamphere and I have been working for the past 30 plus years in improving the um, capacity of individuals and organizations in supply chain um, across a number of program areas, including family planning, immunization, maternal and child health. Um, and I want to say it was great to see so many of you at the Global Health Supply Chain Summit meeting last month in Johannesburg and to, to meet so many of you in person. Greg? Okay, thanks, Barbara. And I, as a reminder, I'm Greg Roche, and I've been working in capacity building and supply chain management for about 20 years. And before that, I was working on uh, just general education, capacity building, organizational development, and so forth. We have a very special guest today, Amos Chueya. Hi, Amos. Can you introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, Greg, and hi, all. My name is uh, Amos Chueya. I work at GSI as a regional immunization technical officer supporting immunization supply chain in uh, the African sub-region, that is East and South Africa. I have been working in this position for close to 30 years, having served the Ministry of Health EPI program in Kenya for 15 years, and later joined GSI. Okay, thanks. And we'll be hearing from Amos from time to time throughout the webinar. We're very happy that he could join us. So let's look at the objectives for this webinar on linking supply chain management to coverage. We'll start by thinking about how supply chain can impact vaccine coverage. Then we'll look at indicators, this time for both supply chain and for EPI coverage, and see what relationships we can find between the two. We will then see how we can use both supply chain and program or health system indicators and those data together to assess what might be going on in our systems or in our programs. And finally, we'll be thinking about the positive effects that a strong supply chain can have on coverage and equity. As usual, we have a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. So let's tackle our first objective by looking at how supply chain performance can impact EPI program performance. And let's take advantage of Amos's participation to get some groundwork questions answered on supply chain performance and EPI program coverage. Perhaps we can start with a basic definition. Amos, how would you define or explain the concept of vaccine or immunization coverage to our participants? Um, thank you, Barbara. If we looked or searched for a definition of coverage, there are many variations. But here is one definition of vaccine coverage that we will use. 
simply put, we think of immunization coverage or vaccine coverage as a percentage of children who have received one or more vaccines in relation to the overall population. In this definition, we focus, our focus is on, the, on children, which is a very common target for uh, population for vaccinations. We can also describe vaccine coverage in, ter in terms of a general target population. As in this second definition, which says that it's, a, it's the percentage of target population who receive one or more vaccines in relation to the overall target population. If you are able to attend or watch um, a recording of the webinar on managing immunization supply chain performance, the terminology here is familiar. Percentages and proportions. We are talking again about indicators, this time for assessing program performance. We will see this in more details shortly. And as a note, we will use the terms vaccine coverage and immunization coverage interchangeably during uh, this webinar. Also, we can provide you with references to other definitions and explanations after the webinar. Thanks, Amos. Uh, so how would I calculate immunization coverage? Sure, Barbara, it's, uh, it's simple, really. Um, we would compare the number of doses or number of children or people vaccinated to the overall target population. Um, for this and most calculations, we need a numerator and a denominator. The numerator here is the number of individuals in the target group for each vaccine that has received, has, has received uh, uh, in the last recommended dose of the series of the denominator in the number of individuals in the target group of each vaccine. I would, uh, may I allow me to repeat this definition again? Sure. Um, the denominator here is the number of individuals in the target group for each vaccine that has received the last recommended dose of the series and the denominator is the total number of individuals in the target group for each vaccine. <coughs> we need to differentiate these two very clearly, the numerator and the denominator. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it'll make clearer. Let's, let's have a concrete example. Can you give us one, Amos? Sure, I can do that. Um, let's look at a simple calculation. If my number of vaccinated children are 735, 839, and my target population is 825,000, then my coverage is 89.2%. You simply divide 735, 839 over 825,000 times 100, and you get 89.2% as uh, the, the coverage. This is a simplified example just to show calculation of the percent. Okay. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to point out something because this is an important detail. In the numerator, we're really talking about the group that's received the last recommended dose in a series. So it's not just those who've received the first or second dose in a, in a series, but that have completed the full series of the vaccine that, that those are in the, in the numerator. Is that right? That's, yes, you're right. Okay, great. Okay. You may recall from our discussion of cold chain equipment functioning indicator when we were talking about supply chain, um, measuring supply chain performance. Um, so for that indicator of cold chain equipment functioning, we wanted to have disaggregated data in order to find the root causes of any problems. So we would have more detail about what is going on and then be able to determine the corrective action to take. So we hold that same principle here when we talk about vaccine coverage and other EPI program performance indicators. We would like to have some disaggregated data to help us understand what's really happening with, with the coverage. Here are some of the disaggregations we might do to get some further insights into our coverage rates. Yes, Barbara, we, we should also note that it is unlikely that uh, our supply chain performance would be reflected in a specific disaggregation such as age or sex. But we certainly might see differences in, in disaggregated data related to socioeconomic status 
and place of residence, particularly if we are looking at urban versus rural, isolated rural sites. We might also see differences in the coverage rates and related indicators by specific products, which would likely indicate supply chain issues related to those specific vaccines or other products. It seems like the ability to analyze disaggregated data also presumes that we have access to disaggregated data, that it comes up in the system in a format that allows us to see subgroups and not, not only the totals. So we need to be able to have access that, to that data in order to analyze it. Yes, Barbara, that is, that is true. Um, this slide shows some of the age categories by products or say vaccine type we would be interested in for looking at coverage rates in a typical immunization program. Coming back to this idea about the impact of supply chain performance on the EPI program coverage, I think a lot of us are familiar with this saying, no product, no program. Essentially that means if we don't have any products in our system provided by our supply chain, then we will have very, a very difficult time implementing our program and seeing results. For this webinar in particular, I think it's fair to say we can paraphrase the saying to focus on vaccine supply chain and coverage. I think we all agree that if we don't have a well-performing supply chain, it would be difficult to achieve coverage or expand coverage. At the same time, we want to keep in mind from the start that even if we have a perfect supply chain, it will not necessarily guarantee good vaccine coverage or attaining other EPI program goals, objectives, or targets. There are many other elements that at play. And again, we will see some of these a bit later in the webinar. Now that we have reviewed our supply chain performance indicators and our EPI program and coverage indicators. Let's see how the two might be linked. Um, great. Um, let's then look at some indicators that might help us link supply chain and coverage. Okay, thanks, Amos. So um, I think you know that in the second webinar on monitoring supply chain performance, we looked at a number of supply chain performance indicators, including the seven disk indicators that are shown here. And as we saw earlier, some of these are specific to vaccine supply chains and others are applicable to any supply chain. A question for everyone listening, just looking through these indicators, which do you think might link to coverage? Actually, you know what? Let's do a poll and see which of these indicators do you think are linked to coverage? So please take a minute. I hope you can see the poll on your screen. Uh, now you should be able to see the poll on your screen. And please take a minute to vote. Which of these indicators do you think are linked to coverage? So which of these indicators might have an impact? Which of the supply chain indicators might have an impact on our ability to achieve coverage? We see some votes coming in. Take another minute. It looks like about half of the participants have voted. Look at those indicators, think carefully. Another second or two. Okay, so let's stop, uh, we'll end the voting now and let's just quickly take a look at the results. So I believe, let's see what we can see. We have the uh, number one is on time and in full delivery. So I think a lot of people agree that uh, if we don't have on time and in full delivery, we would have a hard time achieving coverage. 
other people, the next one's up. We have forecasted demand ratio, full stock availability, stock according to plan. So we can see a lot of those, a lot of variation as well, because all of those indicators were chosen by at least uh, several people. So thanks for voting, and let's go ahead and continue uh, the discussion. Um, thanks for, for the voting, and I'm happy that uh, nearly everybody voted for every indicator. Now, I don't think I uh, would be exaggerating if we say that all of these uh, supply chain uh, performance indicators would be linked to coverage. Poor performance for any of these indicators almost surely means that we will have supply chain problems. And if those problems uh, result in no product, then we'll have no program and of course, no coverage. Just wanna go back to that last slide for a moment because I really wanna reinforce that we need to pay attention to all these indicators to ensure coverage. It's not just one or two, but it really is all those indicators. Okay, next slide, please. So based on this model from WHO, we can think of a total of five components or functional areas of our vaccine system or EPI program that we would want to monitor. And you I point out here that only one of them is supply chain. Do you see number two in this representation, vaccine supply, quality, and logistics? There are, we also have the other components that need to be monitored and um, attention paid to. Those include component number one, which is service delivery. Component number three, surveillance and monitoring, our M&E component. Component number four, advocacy and communication. And program, and number five, program management. In order to have a successful immunization program and good coverage rates, all of these components are important for uh, monitoring and performance improvement. So now it's clear, as we said before, supply chain is an important component, but not the only one that can impact the performance of our EPI program, including vaccine coverage. Here are some of the specific indicators that you can track, most of which are related to the service delivery component but also the other components. And of course, we have been talking a lot about supply and logistics indicators. We've already defined coverage. Now, how would we define missed opportunities? Amos, can you give us a, some help on this? Yes, uh, missed opportunities could be when, uh, for example, the mother is there with her child for a vaccine but the service provider is absent that day or the products or the vaccine is not available during that day. Okay, so the mother's made the effort to come to the health center for vaccination, but it's not able to get um, her child vaccinated. Okay, what about dropout rates? Um, again, this would be when a child has received the first dose or doses of a multi-dose regime does not complete the full course of the doses, okay. e.g. measles. Okay, such as measles. Okay, so then they couldn't be counted in that numerator we were talking about before. They haven't completed the full course. Okay, what about reported cases and incidents? Aren't these the same? Well, uh, they are not exactly the same, but they are related. Reported cases is the actual number of cases of vaccine preventable disease that are reported through our HMISs. While incidence is the percentage of occurrence of the vaccine preventable disease in our population, mm -hmm. we would need to know the reported number of cases to be able to calculate the incidence rates. Okay, all right, thanks. So now we have a variety of indicators we can track to assess program performance. Other overall pro program performance indicators and other categories can be found in a WHO publication that we will share after the, the webinar, but we're gonna to continue to focus on our, um, on our supply chain. Um, um, Barbara, okay. maybe, maybe we can do yeah. a quick poll of our participants. Oh, 
Oh, sure. That's a great idea. Okay, let's try one related to some of the program indicators. And um, I'm going to ask um, the ones we've just talked about. So let me pull up a poll. And so I'm going to ask you, um, our, our attendees, to please indicate which of these indicators do you track to measure the effectiveness of your EPI program. And you'll see that there are many of these that, that, that we've um, talked about here. So please go ahead and vote which ones that you, that you um, track on a, normal, on a routine basis. Give it a, a few minutes more. A little more than half of you have voted. Anybody else going to vote? Please do so. I think I'll stop the polling now and, and I'm going to share the results. And it looks like almost everyone who um, participated in the poll, they measure the percent of children vaccinated under one year. Okay. And the one with the least amount or the two that with the least amount are missed opportunities and reported cases. And I'm, uh, I'm just wondering if those are ones that it's harder to get the data for to understand what's going on. That's probably the case. Maybe in our Q&A people can give some, some, when we have some discussion at the end, we can, we can discuss a little bit what are some of the problems in, in um, tracking some of these things like missed opportunities and reported cases. Well, thanks for um, for sharing your um, your information about your programs, and I'm going to close these this polling results. Yes, and and Barbara, I I think we also need to keep in mind that uh, for some of these indicators, such as uh, missed opportunities or dropout rates, for example, there can be a lot going on in the overall system that has nothing really to do with the effectiveness of our supply chain or a relationship with product availability. Okay, good to keep in mind. So here's a website that you can use to look at vaccine program data for your country or for other countries or for your region. This link will be shared with you at the end of the webinar. Okay, thanks. Now that we've reviewed our supply chain performance indicators and seen some examples of EPI program coverage indicators, let's see how we might use these two sets of indicators together to see how our supply chain performance may be impacting our program coverage. We can probably compare and contrast the different indicators in different pairings, but here we will focus on just a few examples of comparing supply chain and program indicators, and mostly coming from that second area that Barbara showed earlier of uh, um, uh, service availability. So here we see uh, a comparison of stockout rates and coverage. And based on this imaginary data, we can see a correlation between low stockouts and high coverage. I think we would expect that these two numbers would go together. Low stockouts should contribute to higher coverage, assuming other elements of our service provision system are working well. 
Here we have a comparison between coverage and stocked according to plan, which would be stocked in compliance with established maximum and minimum inventory control stock levels. I think we would again expect to see a correlation between the two. If products are stocked according to plan, if they're between the minimum and the maximum stock level consistently, that should likely contribute to higher coverage. But again, we have to assume that in that case, other elements of our service provision system are also working well. Here we see an example where we can compare st low stockout rates and our ability to meet targets being high. Again, that's very likely. If we have low stockouts, we would expect coverage to be high if other things are working. But in this example, what happened in May? We see a sharp rise in our stockout rate and a corresponding drop in the targets being met. Again, this would demonstrate a correlation, but not necessarily cause and effect. We would need to investigate more to verify if we saw a graph such as this in using our program and our supply chain data. Here we see an example of a low rate of stockouts, but a high rate of targets not being met. If we were to see a comparison like this one in our actual country data, then we would likely have to find another cause for the targets not being met, perhaps not related to our supply chain performance, but rather some other area. Maybe the campaigns were missed or they weren't done on time. We have a lack of trained healthcare workers and so forth. But if you can match low coverage rates to supply chain challenges, such as stockouts, not getting full order quantity and so forth, maybe wastage rates, then you can do a supply chain improvement intervention and closely monitor the results. If the coverage rates increase or not, if they go up only slightly perhaps, then we know that we probably have another factor at play and we would have to look elsewhere aside from the supply chain for the other root cause of those targets not being met. Here's a different kind of example, comparing coverage rates in different parts of the country. When we look at this graph, we start to ask about what might be happening in the Western region compared to the other regions because their rates are so much lower. It might be something directly related to the supply chain. But in any case, if we were to see data such as this in our country data, we would want to look further into what is going on in the Western region to understand if it is a supply chain issue or if it's something else. Maybe the region has fewer trained service providers, something else like this, geographical challenges. This example also points out the need for our data to be disaggregated, as Barbara and Amos were discussing earlier. If we were only to look at the aggregated data that is shown in the dark black line here in this graph, we might be satisfied with the overall average and look no further. But if we look at the disaggregated data, we can see that there is a serious problem in the, or more serious problem, let's say, in the Western region. So again, having that disaggregated data would be very helpful to us in understanding the situation. Also related to disaggregation, we have to be able to match coverage rates with available health and supply chain data. If our HMIS, if our health data goes down to the facility level, but we don't have visibility into the logistics data down to the facility level, then we would not be able to identify instances where supply chain problems impact coverage. So we've been looking at some graphs that show, we've been imaginary data just to see how we can compare different supply chain and program indicators. Uh, but those have been theoretical examples of something that we think we know intuitively. But Amos, we're looking at something quite different in this example. What are we looking at here? Yes, Greg. Um, I think we agree that it's logical to assume that coverage will decrease if product availability decreases. What we have in here is some data from a data review team 
in uh, a county in Kenya. Um, that uh, data review team was looking specifically at this issue of product availability and coverage to understand the impact of a strike that was held by nurses in that county. Now, this chart compares available and doses administered for pentavalent vaccine. We can see that the trend lines exactly mirror each other. When, other, when stock availability dropped from May to October, the number of doses administered also dropped dramatically. Now, this is because uh, the service providers who are on strike are the same one who made orders for vaccine delivery from the next level. So they were not making orders, the vaccines were not available, and therefore um, the kids were, 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 were not vaccinated. And it is the doses administered that we would use to calculate our coverage. So yes, from the data we see, easily conclude that uh, coverage will drop when uh, product availability falls. Okay, thanks for that example. So we've just been talking a little bit about how we cannot expand our coverage without making improvements in our supply chain. The reverse is that the more you're able to reinforce your supply chain and get products closer and closer to the clients, the more you are able to expand coverage. The more you try to expand coverage, for example, by training more health workers, including community-based workers, et cetera, the more you complicate the supply chain, actually. The more distribution points, the more distribution nodes to manage, possibly more cold chain, or definitely more cold chain, stock holding requirements, data at more levels, possibly more open vial wastage if health workers are serving smaller and smaller communities and have multi-dose vials. So the, the more we expand our coverage, the more we need to expand our supply chain, but it also becomes a more complicated system. All for the good though. Yeah, of course it's all for the good. Uh, let's look at a couple of potential examples of this relationship between wanting to expand coverage and how that might have an impact or uh, increase the requirements of our supply chain. So let's think about things in two ways. If we increase the capacity and the reach of our supply chain, then we may be able to have a positive impact on coverage. And equally, the reverse. If we want to increase our coverage, it will require supply chain improvements or supply chain strengthening efforts. We need both of those things together. If we were to train, for example, more health service providers to give vaccines farther down the system, closer and closer into the more remote areas of the country, those service providers would then obviously need access to vaccines through the supply chain. They will also likely need cold chain equipment farther down the supply chain and at the community health worker level, due to the number of providers and maybe the quantities that they would be managing, this would likely mean a passive equipment for cold chain and probably also the need for access to ice or ice packs. If we were to do trainings so that more service providers are available in the same geographical area, the target population is not really increased. It's the same target area but we still might need to anticipate some increase in consumption as services are somewhat more readily available. So our supply chain would have to be able to manage those slightly higher quantities. If we were to open full-time dedicated vaccine centers, for another example, we may see increase in consumption since the dedicated centers might reinforce among the population that vaccines are more important and they'll be more motivated to take their children, leading to more increases in consumption. If we were to do vaccine campaigns, most countries, practically probably every country does, either yearly, six monthly, quarterly, whatever, we would also need to increase our supplies and have them in place in time for the campaign. So we really have to plan ahead. We also need to monitor very closely 
wastage. And we have to have a means to collect or otherwise manage the unused vaccine vials for distribution during normal resupply. Again, it's more pressure on our supply chain. In some countries, they might say to return all unused vials to the central warehouse for redistribution. That requires the infrastructure for getting those products back up the system. Or a country may instruct the campaign staff to leave the unused vials in the nearest center or the nearest district without considering if the consumption patterns in that area justify having those quantities or not. So again, supply chain impact on those facilities that need to store larger quantities. If we were to conduct an ongoing immunization advertising or promotion campaign, we may need to plan for some increase in consumption and closely watch those consumption trends. They might show a constant increase over time as the advertisements are broadcast, or perhaps there will be a rapid rise at the start of the campaign, but then a leveling off as the target population is more fully covered. In any case, we need to closely watch any areas where more rapid increases are happening and be ready to move more products to those areas. So in this case, again, we need to have an agile supply chain. So I think before we close the webinar, we want to spend a few minutes thinking about how EPI program managers and immunization supply chain managers can work together to help increase coverage, to improve program indicators through attention to the supply chain. Um, Greg, you are absolutely correct. Um, we have talked about supply chain performance and coverage and how the two are linked. So a couple of specific actions that EPI managers might take will include a um, report on stock status as you report on coverage. Okay, thanks. So we talked about the need to have the, both of those types of data available in order to do these comparisons. And if we have those two data types available at the right levels and so forth in our system, then we can really track the relationship between stock availability and coverage. That's sort of the baseline. Uh, they also need to create agents around preventing stockouts. Okay, so we don't want people to be, we don't want the program folks to be passive and say, oh, oops, we have a stock out. We want to really be able to understand what's going on with our stock outs and have people really be prepared to deal with those stock outs. So a couple of ideas, we could do a survey. If we, if we were lacking some data from our regular reporting system, let's conduct a quick survey, see what the stock on hand data is, see what our months of stock on hand is, and do some resupplies uh, as needed. We also want to think about the system as a whole and ensuring that there is an emergency order point so that people know what the process is. If I reach this low stock level, maybe it's a half month of stock, maybe it's a quarter month of stock, it's time to place an emergency order to avoid the stock out before it happens. Uh, they also need to review their program strategic plans uh, for increasing coverage, of course, linking them with strategic uh, supply chain and strategic plans. Okay, so we have to think about if our program wants to increase coverage and how do we plan to increase coverage? What are the supply chain implications? How does our supply chain have to be prepared in order to respond to that, uh, that uh, program requirement? Are there any special actions that are needed to implement for uh, planning or preparation? And lastly, of course, advocate for ongoing supply chain strengthening. Absolutely. It's not only the supply chain people's job to look after the supply chain. They need assistance from the program folks, and the program folks need to be supported by the supply chain folks. So, one of our public health goals is a healthy population. And I think we agree that we need a wide coverage of our vaccines in order to help with this. And our overall goal is to increase coverage as much as possible to reduce the incidence of vaccine preventable diseases in children. 
And we can get there in part through supply chain improvements and performance. And uh, here we want to close by coming back to the purpose of our supply chain in the first place, serving customers. In this case, making sure that uh, people and especially our children are fully vaccinated. It really is an investment in our future. So this is the end of this webinar. Today we have explained the impact that supply chain and product availability has on EPI program coverage. We've identified the data and associated indicators that link supply chain management to EPI coverage. We've also looked at some examples where we've triangulated supply chain and coverage data to better address challenges in achieving coverage targets. And we've described the positive effects that strengthening supply chains and increasing coordination has on health system strength and immunization coverage and equity. And now we have time and we have time to discuss some of the questions that have come in. So let me look at this at some of the, the questions. Um, let's let's look at this. We have one from Amare, um, and I'm going to open this up to, to any of our friends here, um, Greg or Amos, to, to help discuss this. The question is, the indicators are available in various data sources, but at lower level, health workers and supervisors want to see these data pulled out to one simple sheet so that they can use it, use it for day-to-day -day, day -day activities for decision making. Do you have such user-friendly system to use? So do we have a way of making that data more accessible at the health level, the health facility and the supervisor level? Um, Amos, do you have any um, experience with that? In some countries, uh, what uh, they have done is uh, to pull out uh, job aids, to put all those indicators in like one job aid, so mm -hmm. that as a health worker works, is able to make reference to that aid that has been placed strategically where they can see them. So that is one way that uh, uh, the lower service providers can be able to keep reminding themselves about those indicators. Mm -hmm. Greg, do you have any examples of, of that as well? Or? Uh, not so much as a user, friend, not a system per se, like, uh, I, but I love the, the example that Amos gave where you would have one sheet or one tool where you're collecting and bringing in your logistics data from the one side and your health data mm -hmm. from the other side. But I also think about data review teams that we were talking about earlier if you can have your if your data review team can it can include program and supply chain people then you have another additional opportunity for comparing those if each side is preventing or each partner or each team member is presenting their specific data then it should be relatively easy um, mm -hmm. to make comparisons during a yeah. data review meeting for example yeah i was i was thinking of that same thing some of these impact teams that we talked about previously they do i know in in um Myanmar and a couple of places, they have just a paper-based tool which help, which sort of directs them to take data from the dispensing register, data from the stock, the stock ledger, and to work on that and, and to really to calculate some very simple indicators that can be done with, just done there with the, with a calculator. No, nothing too sophisticated, but very powerful, I think, at that level to have just a job aid. Uh, these are da data tally sheets that help them do that. Absolutely. Um, Hanuk has asked a question, is there any standard tool in SOP on how to do data triangulation? Yikes. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a standard tool. There are plenty of tools. <laughs> plenty <laughs> plenty of tools. I think it's really, if we, if we think about the exam, and sorry for jumping in. Sure, um, no problem. But if we think about the, the examples that we gave earlier, it's, I think it's just a question of, the, of trying to say for your program and based on the kinds of data that you have, which comparisons would be the ones that would tell you something about your system and tell you how effective your supply chain is and how it's impacting coverage. So what are the pairings that you want to look at? Is it more important for you to look at stockout rates and coverage 
Is it more important for you to look at stock to core to plan and coverage and things like that? Um, so, so and, but yeah, lots of tools. I don't know about an actual SOP on data triangulation. There mm -hmm. must be some information out there. I don't know, Amos, are you, if, if you guys have done this uh, kind of work, uh, are there any like SOPs or tools for which data to triangulate? Not, not really, but uh, in Kenya, we have an indicator tracking tool that tends to track stock status, tracks coverage, tracks vaccine wastage, and the stocks and the track uh, coverage also about four, four, four areas that are seen in one dashboard that is able to make people be able to see what vaccines they use, what was their coverage, how was their wastage, and, and so on. I, I, I think that is the closest that uh, we, we, we have come to um, in that area. So there yeah. is the impact team. The impact team used that to, to when they are holding their regular uh, impact team meetings. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, uh, ahead of that, before when they were like designing the dashboard or saying, then that, that's where they're choosing which indicators, and then they can see the comparisons between the ones that they've chosen. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Amos, if if people want to ask you questions directly later, would would you be willing to, for us to share your contact information? Is that okay? I'll be more than willing. Okay, great. Okay. Um, there's a, an, another question from one of our colleagues, um, Anupriya. Um, are there any specific measures about how to over, overcome data manipulation while data collection procedure by grassroots workers? Can digitization help or will it be a double edged sword? <laughs> Greg, okay, now that you love yeah. that question. Yeah, because, well, it, and it's only because I do work with, uh, in a number of countries recently, I've been doing work on LMIS, data collection, data validation, data quality, and things like that. And people kind of assume, and that's why I like the, the phrase in the question, is it a double-edged sword? I think it absolutely is a double-edged sword. People think that di digitalization or digitization of data will automatically improve data quality. And my argument is always that if people can make mistakes when they're writing on a piece of paper, they can equally make mistakes when they're tapping on a screen or when they're tapping on a keyboard. So I don't think that just introducing a, digi a digitized system is going to automatically increase your data quality. I think you have to be just as careful in doing your data quality checks whether you're using a paper system or whether you're using an electronic system. And, and also, but one of the things that you can do with the digital system, and I, I agree, but um, I think one of the things you can do in a, in a, when you do digitization is put in some, some logic in the system that helps um, look for abnormalities in Absolutely, data. Absolutely, yes. Or um, does some, you know, does some, some error finding so, for example, you know, in supply chain, we have the common um, data coral, the data check, which is does ending balance equal beginning balance of the next month, and things like that that you can put in there to help improve quality. But it's true that you know you can be the data digitization does not necessarily improve data data quality um, at all. Um, Amos, that. People need to be honest also. They need I know it's <laughs> data manipulation. You you know, you can only understand what what you can see in the data unless you're out there doing some data quality audits to see are people um, correctly recording the information about coverage. Yeah, and you know that you the key, availability. Yeah, perfect. The, because and the key word that you put there, recording, because I think that, that we also have to recognize that it's not a digit a digitized or electronic system may not fully be able to replace paper. I think somewhere along the line, you have to have at least one source document that is paper, so that you can go back and compare. Because otherwise, you'll open a screen. What do you compare it to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. I hope that, it, that we answered your question. <laughs> uh, okay, um, one last question from Abebe. Um, 
It is true supply chain performance is directly related to and, inf and influences immunization coverage. What are the other most important factors affecting coverage in addition to supply chain performance? And he says thank you. He or she says thank you. So what are those other things that really um, affect, affect coverage in addition to the supply chain performance? Amos, I'm going to turn this to, to you. You probably have um, some, uh, some information about this. Yeah, uh, we can have the vaccines, and if the communities don't know that the vaccines are available, then uh, that again will not increase our coverage. So advocacy, communication, and social mobilization is very important. That uh, caregivers know uh, that the need for the kids to get vaccinated, and uh, they know that these vaccines are, av are available, and where they are available, and when they are available, so that they can take uh, uh, their kids or their or themselves for vaccination in those areas. Another key area that we see that is messing many people up is the issue of uh, establishing accurate denominators. That again uh, uh, sometimes keeps giving us false uh, false coverage. Somebody can tell you have a coverage of 200%. And when you do an actual survey, you find that even kids in that area, some of them have not received the vaccine. So there's the issue also of trying to make sure that you, you are very near to your actual denominators. Yeah, those are the two mm -hmm. areas I think of, but I think communication is really most important and uh, of course avail the vaccines. As these people, as the communication people go to bring uh, children for vaccination, let us make sure the vaccines are at the clinics. Great, great. Um, I just wanna share something that was in, it's in the chat from, uh, Simplicius, um, it's, he wrote that most countries use stock management tool, SMT, as a data management system. Has there been any system in place to manage immunization data? Um, does anybody know of any tools that are specific for managing immunization data? DVDMT uh, tries to manage both immunization data and the stock data. So that's one tool one can make reference to. Mm -hmm. TV, EMT. Okay. EMT, yes. Okay, great. And we'll, is that, um, we'll put links some information to that um, in our follow-up email to you all. Um, and uh, Hanuka is saying, yes, we have in, in Ethiopia, we have Embrana. And that's something that Ethiopia has um, developed it it's on its own, right? Um, Hanok, that's your, your, um, this is an Ethiopia specific um, application. But if you would, Hanok, if you could um, give, if you have any information that we can share with our, with our whole group, please feel free to send me a link and I will include it in the follow-up email about Embrana. Um, that would be, that might be interesting to our participants. Um, and I think we have, we have VIMS in Tanzania also. Okay, we have VIMS with we have VIMS in, in Tanzania. Yes, right. We could also we have the vaccine information management system. Information management system, okay. Um, there's one last question that's open. Um, in a situation where the target population is unrealistic, it's possible to use consumption method to forecast for vaccine and other supplies. Um, so this is a question, is it possible to use the consumption me method to forecast for vaccines and other supplies? So when there's, where the target population is unrealistic, and I think this is a comparison of target-based forecasting versus consumption-based forecasting. Um, Greg, do you, wanna, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree that, you know, you go into a country, you go into a, you, you can go into a country and the, their target is 100%, 100%. okay, maybe. Um, but I, I, think, um, I think I would always say setting targets is fine, it's a goal, but I think you should look at your other uh, data sources and try to see what's actually happening. And then maybe you have to have a compromise between the two. You say, for example, our current logistics data says that we're distributing 100,000, our target is the number of children that will require 200,000, 
is it realistic to have 200,000 next year? Maybe we want to go 10%, 10%, 10% over time. But I think it, uh, I think it, what you were saying earlier about doing your forecast using multiple uh, data sources, I would always recommend vaccines, any program, try to look at as many different data sources as possible, and then don't rely just on one for your, for your complete uh, picture. Great, thanks. We're getting close to the end. I just have one more comment that came in on the Q&A. Oops, we have another one. <laughs> um, but the comment from Fatima is DHIS2 is the best tool for immunization data. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked, what is the impact of adverse effects monitoring following immunization on coverage? So what is the impact of adverse effects events monitoring on coverage? Um, Amos, do you have any? Um, let, let me let me give you that yeah. shot and see. Um, okay. <laughs> um, it's it's very important that uh, programs monitor adverse events following immunization. Um, uh, for one, um, to assure the community that the vaccines people are receiving are safe, and in case of an event then we can quickly be able to withdraw that vaccine. So I don't know what the question was, but I think it's, 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 import, it's important that we monitor adverse events regularly. It must be monitored continuously so that we don't have uh, many events happening within a given locality. Right. So I don't think there's anything negative about that one. Right. We need to monitor it and we need to make sure that uh, we, are big, we are giving our populations um, safe vaccines. Greg, maybe you want to add something? Well, I just want to also comment on this aspect of how does that impact on coverage? If you have, if you have batches of vaccines or you have a, a vaccine that has a high number of adverse events, then you yes. need to replace that product with a good product or a better product so that you can keep the vaccine rates higher um, and that's going, to, that's going to keep your coverage rate higher. Yeah, otherwise, okay. if you have those events, then the coverage will go down. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and we had one last question, which I don't think we're going to be able to answer because it's much more complicated. How to forecast for a newly introduced vaccine. And um, let me get back to you, um, Somolo, on that um, offline. Um, or on, when do we start, put that on IPHL for a discussion? I was just going to say, yeah. That's a, that would be a good discussion topic because it's much longer than we can have in our last two minutes of this, of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for your great um, questions today. Uh, I would like to remind you that um, you will be receiving a follow-up email with a link um, not only to um, all the references that we talked about today, I will put in some links about some of these things we've been discussing in the, in the um, discussion here in the Q&A about VIMS, Embrana, um, the SMT, the um, stock management tool. I'll, I'll add some links about that as well. I will also be sending you a link to the gaming application. Hopefully you will use that app to review some of what we talked about today. Um, and you will also be receiving an evaluation form in that same follow-up email. We will hope that you have, um, that you'll be able to participate in the, in the next webinar on managing vaccines with other health commodities, which will take place on Tuesday, February 4th at 1300 GMT. And that registration link for that webinar will be included in the follow-up email. Many thanks to you, Amos, for joining us in today's discussion. Um, Thank you. Appreciate your input and many thanks to everybody um, else for joining us. Happy holidays to those of you who, who are celebrating at this point and happy new year to you all. And we'll see you in 2020. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.